What I'm going to do now is play you uh, what, what originally is a six-minute movie, but I'm going to compress it by a factor of three to just a couple of minutes. In this case, I'm going to start this earthquake down near California. We don't like California that much, so let's start it down there. But unfortunately, it's going to propagate or progress because a fault doesn't go all at once, but it, it, it expands the rip, just like you tear a piece of paper. You don't tear it all at once, but it, it rips up the coast, and it's going to be radiating energy all the way. And you will see the this, this seismic waves coming off of this, the P wave in one color, and the secondary or stronger shear wave where the damage is done in another. And you can sort of get a feeling then how early warning might, might work. But the, the film is running and the earthquake is taking off and we cannot stop an earthquake once it's going. So, uh, the yellow is the P wave going out and you can see by this time we're, we're over a minute into the event and the warning has gone out. The P wave has not even reached Seattle yet. So we could, here even in Portland, have been warned about this event. The S wave will reach Portland shortly and at the beginning of that you would then start to feel it but it's from S waves way down in the south. Where you're really going to get it is when the f part of the fault propagating by you radiates. So the closer that break is to you, the stronger the shaking is going to be. So now we're three minutes into this, halfway there. And at this point, the first S waves are hitting Seattle. Down at the bottom, you see this, this zone and this red is showing something about what the shaking would be like all the way up in Seattle. That's where I live, so that's where it's important. <laughs> um, so finally, now we're four minutes into the earthquake, the shaking now is starting to get more severe. Now following the, the, the shear waves, the S waves, are the surface waves. And these can actually build up in sedimentary basins, shaking for longer and harder. And so a lot of the damage will follow some time after the, sh the, the shear waves. And so after it's ripped up to Canada, and of course they've been hammered as well, uh, then the real shaking ends up in the, the, the sedimentary basins where a lot of the urban centers are in the northwest. So you can see when this thing is finished, six minutes in, we had an alarm way back here, maybe in the first 30 seconds or so. You could have, I don't know, three or four, five minutes even, possibly, of warning in this case. This is sort of the best possible case. Now, if it started right off our coast, just next to Portland, you might not have maybe 30 seconds warning, 40 seconds warning. So uh, Seattle might have more if it was there, but you can see uh, it, it, it's a possibility. But you must think yourself, what would you do if you had, you know, that suddenly the announcement comes on, you know, a large earthquake has occurred, storm shaking will arrive within 60 seconds. <laughs> I don't know, what do you do? <laughs> there, there's, there may be things you can do. This type of technology is being used now in Japan, in Mexico, several other places are cranking up to do it. And in fact, California, they're running experiments to see if it can be done there. And maybe we should think about doing it here. I don't know. My, my personal feeling about this is that, that the, the, the science and the technology in this case may be sort of jumping ahead of, of what we can do. There's sort of a big question here, and that is, can, can earthquake prediction or even early warning currently be really socially useful? And we're not, we're not really sure, but we know that forecasting, knowing something about the likelihood of earthquakes in the future, can. What that amounts to is really a rather sort of boring part of it. Even a seismologist sometimes yawn when you talk about uh, things like seismic hazard maps. What's the likelihood of a certain area being shaken this hard over this length of time? But this is really critical information because the engineers that build our buildings that we live in and work in need this sort of information so that they can try to do the best job possible making that building not fall on your head. And quite frankly, they do a pretty darn good job. The differences between, for example, Chile, magnitude 8.8, .8, a couple of thousand people did die in that, but lots and lots of buildings went through it with not terribly serious damage 
compared to a much smaller earthquake, only magnitude 7 in Haiti, where a quarter of a million people died. Virtually all of those differences are in the engineering, the building of the, the buildings that people lived in. So we're talking, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is the really critical part of seismology, I think, that's socially useful. Now many of us, and you'll hear at the meeting tomorrow if you go, we're really excited about all this new stuff, earthquake prediction, uh, early warning, and whatnot. Well, we're always pushing forward. Well, I think it's time for our final exam. Sorry about this. But I think you know enough to actually get a, a, an A-plus on this, right? Let's run through it real quickly. There will be an earthquake in western Washington tomorrow. True or false? True. Because I don't say how big. There are lots of tiny earthquakes all the time. A magnitude six and a half or greater earthquake will occur next month. True. There's probably a dozen, more than a dozen earthquakes of that size somewhere in the year every month. Almost assuredly there will be one somewhere. A magnitude eight or greater earthquake will occur in the Pacific Northwest. True. Yes. We don't know when though. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> and my favorite, we will be able to anticipate the next volcanic eruptions in the Cascades on the order of days to weeks ahead of time. True. A caveat to that, however, is that that assumes that our monitoring will be in place at an adequate level. And it's pretty good right now. There are a few holes that need to be filled in, but in general, uh, we're, we're in fairly good shape for, uh, for recognizing uh, an earthquake or uh, an eruption enough time to be socially useful uh, ahead of time. And when I first started in seismology 40 plus years ago, geez, I ran into Charlie Richter in the hall of Caltech and asked him about earthquake prediction. <laughs> well, he didn't speak kindly about the attempts even. And to a certain degree, I think he's probably right today. But again, the, the, the critical parts of this is that it's not the earthquakes that kill people, it's failing buildings. So if we can really anticipate what type of ground motion a building is likely to receive in its, in its lifetime, uh, we don't really need to predict the specific earthquake. I'd like to uh, end up just uh, giving some credit to uh, this book that just came out. I, actually, I put this talk together last fall, and this book was published uh, around Christmas this year, and when I saw it, I thought, whoa, what's going on here? This is, this is my talk. And I read it. It's great. Wonderfully written. Uh, it's very approachable. It covers a lot of the things I've, I've talked about today, plus quite a few others, uh, and really gives you a sense of, of the history of how this is progressing. But the title is, um, is, is disconcerting, predicting the unpredictable, because at this point, uh, that's what it is. So I'd like to thank you for your attention.